12 step recovery procedures the procedure for spiritual awakening part two we will take a little different spin on the instructions on how to conduct a resentment inventory and amends there may be people in your life story where you still harbor some uncomfortable feelings towards their defects of character that may have caused you harm or damage. You may still feel sore about it and unwilling to forgive their actions. If you don't have any such people on your list, you can still do this exercise. Just write down all the names of the people in your life in which you feel smugly superior to. This exercise will work in both categories. I used to think that I had only five people I resented, but each time I wrote down the five names, another five names of more people I resented would appear inside my head. At the time, I didn't think I had too much of a problem with resentment. Okay, write down the names of 10 people, places, or institutions that you may harbor unhealthy feelings toward from your life story. Pause the slideshow to make this list. So now we're going to follow the basically the same one sentence procedure, but from a little different perspective. We're going to play the prosecuting attorney and next to or underneath their name, we will list in one sentence what it is we think was their crime. Pause the slideshow and address each person's name with one sentence. Okay, now that you're back, you're going to make a proper case for your day in court. So you will also have to make a list of damages caused by these crimes. So with each name, go back and write one sentence describing what damages to yourself their crimes caused. Pause the slideshow and uh, we'll start when you get finished with that. A few examples would be my boss reprimanded me, reprimanded me. His actions injured my pride. I found out that the secretary pool gossiped about me. My reputation was damaged. Dan competed against me. He threatened my security. Cliff got the promotion and the attention in which I feel I was more deserving. His success injured my self-esteem. Okay, so now you made the case and presented your case to your higher spiritual power. Are you ready for the verdict? What? The, ver the verdict is not guilty. After we have spent so much time and energy in developing our case. But in the eyes of our higher spiritual power, they can only be innocent. So maybe we shouldn't spend so much time and so much emotional energy into making our case against humanity, especially if the verdict is always going to be the same, not guilty. So in the next step, I'm sorry. So the next step in this process would be to go back to your list, cross off each name, and then put down your name. Write down how you may have hurt yourself without being aware. This is an exercise in self-honesty and may be difficult. So I will provide you some examples of my own first. I now have rewritten the script to put myself in the role of the offender. I reprimanded myself. I injured my pride. I listened to gossip about gossip. I degraded my reputation by entertaining such nonsense. I competed as well. I made myself believe that my security was threatened. Because I put a lot of energy into getting promoted, I was highly disappointed and blamed Cliff instead of just accepting defeat as part of life. I let my thinking affect my esteem. In this exercise, it becomes apparent that I used blame and resentment to divert the pain of blaming myself. This ploy is based upon ignorance, and we subconsciously think that this method will help us. But in doing this exercise, we can see 
how it has perhaps made things worse. Okay, go back to the 10 names that you have and follow this procedure, rewriting your case and identifying what role you played in hurting yourself. Stop the presentation till until you have finished and reviewed what you wrote. Now there is a very common mistake that can be made at this point as well. Instead of focusing our blame and resentment outward, we do the opposite, thinking that this is the correct procedure to follow. We focus all the blame upon ourselves. Without doing written exercises and making these lists, we might, in our head, believe such thoughts and actions to be the correct way to go about it. But when we put it on paper and talk about it with others, we can see how utterly ridiculous some of these, some of our best thinking can be. The story of the Buddha is that he was born into royalty and never wanted for anything. His parents overinsured that their son would never be exposed to the hardships of the world. When he finally saw the hunger, poverty, and suffering that existed behind the facade his parents created, he turned his life into an ascetic, denying himself all worldly pleasures. But later, he discovered that neither extreme was effective, and he chose the middle path. His spiritual and moral doctrine was based upon an analogy on the proper string tension for a sitar. If the string is too tight, it will break. And if the string is too loose, it will not function. To produce a pleasing sound, the sitar string must be adjusted in the middle. Correcting our daily walk to the extremes will never get us to our destination. As we travel from one point to another, we may need to make extreme adjustments to overcome or avoid obstacles. But generally, we just make very minor adjustments to our course in order to stay on the sidewalk or in the correct lane. We mostly choose the middle path in our activities as the best choice. In 12 step meetings, some people tell the same story over and over again. When I was younger, I groaned. But now I look forward with delight to hear the same story which helped me recover to be more to a more sane attitude. One such man would tell us to never say, I am proud to be a member of this 12-step recovery program. Instead, he said, we should say, I am grateful to be a member of the 12-step recovery program. I can't tell you how many times he said the same thing. But when I moved away for a better job, his voice and his statement went along with me. We are often unaware of how much we use resentment and blame until we do these exercises, such as the one we just completed. Now we have a new perspective and we might wish to correct this faulty programming of our subconscious mind. If you can afford to run to the hypnotherapist, by all means do so. They have much better training in this field but there is also a technique of self-hypnosis that is by far much less expensive. You may need the help of a spiritually awakened trusted friend, or you may just want to experiment with this moral and spiritual method that I am presenting. From some of the previous exercises reviewing our life story, we have discovered that often our willpower, awareness, and self-sufficiency have not been enough to correct our thinking, emotions, and behavior in order to make better decisions and manage well in our, in our lives. How can we make it better? That is the definition for the amends that I'm talking about. Our amends will be conducted through meditation and prayer, asking for our newly discovered negative habits to be removed and then replaced with a new and improved spiritual moral for successfully dealing with our life's problems and disappointments. So first I will go over the amends procedure and then we will go do a practice session so that you can experience the effectiveness of the procedure. The procedure that we will follow is to meditate, to remove ego from the equation, then with each name ask your higher spiritual power which means to pray. We pray for sanity, 
which is a light definition meaning healthy emotions, thoughts, words, and behavior. We pray to avoid resentment, anger, argument, and retaliation. We pray to feel genuine forgiveness, peace, calm, and empathy for ourselves and for the other person. And we pray that they may achieve the same spiritual awakening and elevated consciousness that we are seeking. When you can say the prayer and truly mean it, you have experienced forgiveness. Repeat this procedure as necessary when the same or a new resentment raises its ugly head. The amends are as simple as going into a state of meditation and saying a prayer for good for yourself and the person that you harbor the undesirable feelings toward. For the purposes of this workshop, simplicity should be used as an effective tool in teaching others something. However, simplicity is not the end point or destination. Teaching one a simple concept and then another often adds up to a very complex understanding of subjects of which are often beyond our total understanding. And before anyone can be taught anything, they must have the desire and the motivation to be taught. There is much to be said and taught about the process of meditation, in which I cannot possibly cover in this presentation. I just read something from Yogananda in his book, Journey to Self-Realization describing meditation, which is apropos in providing motivation and desire to know more about the practice of meditation. He said, those whose breath, life, and feeling are calm can have faith born of intuition, which cannot be possessed by people who are emotionally restless. The cultivation of intuitive calmness requires the unfoldment of the inner life. When development sufficiently when developed sufficiently, intuition brings immediate comprehension of truth. Meditation is the way to have this marvelous realization. Meditate with patience and persistence. In the gathering calmness, you will enter the realm of soul intuition. Throughout the ages, those who attained enlightenment were those who had recourse to this inner world of God communion. There is much written and taught about prayer. Many of you reviewing this have greater knowledge about this subject than I. For the purposes of this presentation, the definition for prayer will be that once the applicant has applied a suitable method of meditation and entered into the calm state Prayer will be used to ask whatever concept of a higher spiritual power you previously developed to assist you in the removal of the less desirable emotion, belief, thinking, or behavior that you have discovered in the moral inventory and to replace it with a more desirable attribute of your own understanding. However, most 12-step procedures have very specific prayers written in their literature. Be open-minded in this case and give it a try a few times if you don't get satisfactory results at first. There are many, many resources of information about effective prayer techniques and the spiritual treatments and effective results is what you're looking for in this exercise. In this calm state of mind where our emotional ego has been excluded, we may ask for sanity. Again, very mild definitions of these words are to be used. We are asking for healthy thoughts and emotions. In this state of mind, you will also be able to pray for the targeted person so that their thought and emotions concerning you are healthy as well. You should ask that any thoughts or feelings for argument and retaliation be removed from yourself as well as the person the resentment is against. Ask for yourself and the other party for things such as forgiveness, calm, peace, and empathy. Ask that they may achieve the same spiritual awakening and elevated consciousness that you are seeking. 
Ask that these new and improved thoughts and feelings may enter your subconscious mind as well as your heart. Now we come out of meditation at a much higher level of consciousness than when we entered. And wait to see what happens. Look and see what thoughts come to mind in your idle time. If you have to work or encounter that person again, or that place or institution routinely, see if the old feelings wake up again. And if they do, take immediate action. These procedures are not foolproof or guaranteed. Things do not always function in the way that they were planned. The first few times, you may just reawaken the baby you just put down to rest. These procedures require hope, practice, and persistence, and sometimes you might make only small gains. But as with treading water, you will have to keep at it or sink back down to the bottom. However, at any time you wish to have your misery back, that can be refunded to you. And your misery will only motivate you to start treading the water again. You might just want to read the book, How to Tread Water Easily and Effortlessly. So now let's give it a try. The medita meditation technique that I learned was for the person meditating to be able to do it in any setting. So the lights will not be turned down. There is no soft music playing. There is usually nothing done to prevent outside noises from entering the room and so forth. In the process of going into the state of meditation, you instruct your subconscious mind to ignore sound, lights, and interruptions. You suggest to yourself that these so-called interferences to your meditation make you more relaxed and enhance your meditation. That it need be, you can meditate with your eyes open, even driving, and you will be alert and concentrated on the task at hand and still be able to conduct this calming and mind-altering correction. In fact, for me, driving is where I need this procedure the most, and often the correction must be immediate and cannot wait till later. But for this exercise, sit or lay down or get into a comfortable position you desire. I am sure that many of you here for this presentation have much greater experience with meditation. So bear with me because I am presenting this information as if the person were doing it for the first time. Okay, so now I want you to pick just one name of a person from the previous exercise. You may have already forgiven them and came to peace with the whole situation, but then they just walked into the room you were in and the whole thing wakes up again. And again, if you are one who never has resentments, and I believe there are those of you who are in that category, just pick a name of someone who annoys you. Again, the induction procedure for meditation and hypnosis are very similar. The differences being with hypnosis, you are dealing with the subconscious mind, and with meditation, you're attempting to enter the spiritual realm or the superconscious mind to obtain communion with your higher spiritual power. Entering this state of mind requires a great deal of trust with the person facilitating the induction process, as well as knowledge and trust that you will not be reprogrammed with something contrary to your will and ethics. At any point in the process where you suspect or feel something contrary to your well-being and best interests, you should make sure that you can come out of the trance state by tapping your fingers and counting to five. Likewise, if there is outside noise, a plane, or someone walks into the room late after the induction has begun, a method that can be employed is to suggest to yourself that this interruption or noise makes you even more relaxed than a second ago. If you open your eyes, just tell yourself that when you close your eyes again, that in closing your eyes, you will now be more relaxed than previously. The induction procedure is based upon accepting suggestions to your subconscious to compound your state of relaxation more and more until you enter the trance state of mind. 
So now you can follow by words or you can do any procedure that you normally do. But for the next five minutes or so, we will be going into the induction of meditation. So think about your eyelids and with one part of your mind, you know you can always open or close your eyelids. But at this time, you choose to close them so that you can enter a meditative state of mind. Then close your eyes and just feel the relaxation. With another part of your mind, suggest to yourself that your eyelids will remain closed, as if they were too heavy to lift up or as if they were glued shut. You make these suggestions to your own beautiful mind, feeling safe and secure and relaxed. Now think about the muscles and the nerves that control your eyes and allow all the muscles and nerves that are associated with your eyes to relax all the way back to your brain where your vision takes place. Think about the space that this occupies. And now think about relaxing all the muscles and nerves associated with your vision. For meditation, you will not require your physical vision for a short while. So just enjoy the relaxation and rest your eyes and brain for a short period of time. Now going into a deeper level, think about your ears and let all the muscles and nerves associated with your ears relax all the way to your brain where your hearing takes place. Think about the area this occupies and think about all the complex activity that is involved with your hearing. Now with your mind, let everything involved take a break and relax for a short while. You will hear my words, but other sounds and activities will not need to be detected because you are presently in a safe and secure location relaxing your body and mind to enter into a deep state of meditation. Think relaxation and then feel it come over you. Now going even deeper, think about your nose and all its complex systems and cells to breathe, detect odor, and fight off infections. Allow all the parts of the nose the muscles, the nerves, the sinuses, the mucous glands, the cells, even the DNA within the cells and uh, internal organelles within each cell to relax completely. Think about the area of your nose, the airways, the olfactory and immune system operations and allow that complete area to relax. Think relaxation and now feel it going deeper and deeper into a meditative state, trying to enter the spiritual realm and communing with your higher spiritual power. Now, going deeper and deeper, think about the area your mouth, jaws, teeth, and tongue occupy. Think about all the muscles, tendons, and ligature it requires to operate your jaws. Think about the intricate blood, uh, the intricate systems of blood vessels and nerves that run through this area of your body. Think about the taste organs, the salivary glands, the digestive fluids, the immune system activities, and so forth that pertain to your mouth. Think about the complexity of speech that is projected from your mouth. Now allow all this activity to be put on hold and relax for a short while that you are meditating. Think relaxation and allow it to happen. Now, going into a very deep meditative state, think about the many complex areas of your neck. Think about under your chin, your throat, your vocal cords, your major circulation and nervous system passageways through the neck, neck muscles, ligature, discs, bone padding, bone marrow, and so on. But now allow everything to go into stasis and relax, increasing and compounding your total relaxed state of mind and body.
Think about the many other amazing parts of your body and let everything relax. You can go into areas like your feet and relax everything in an upward motion to the top of your head. Feeling those parts that need more relaxation to tingle or quiver a little until they are completely relaxed. If you like, you can focus on each energy center or chakra. Or you can imagine running soothing electrical current up and down the spine with each breath. If you desire, you can mentally relax every complex organ of your body. Your liver, your brain, your spleen, your stomach, your heart, your pancreas, your gallbladder, and so on. You can relax each area into silence, allowing it to operate effectively and efficiency, efficiently, but without any undue stress or angst. Likewise, there are many complex systems involved in your body, whether it is respiratory, circulatory, digestive, urinary tract, skeletal, skin, and so forth. With your own beautiful mind, you are going to turn down the dial to slow motion. Relax and know that the present immobility of your body is safe and protected, and you are able to relax more and more. We are compounding relaxation upon relaxation. All the cells, molecules, and atoms that make up the matter of your body can also slow down in activity at your suggestion. With your body systems in a very relaxed state, the need for outside nutrition or air is greatly reduced. You are allowing your body to go into a deep meditative state, but your mind remains alert and clear. Now, as I count from five to one, allow your body relaxation to double with each number. As I say the number five, imagine yourself going two times deeper into a meditative state, feeling relaxed and safe. We are compounding our relaxation, going deeper and deeper into meditation. Four, Feel the relaxation compound again, doubling your relaxation from the previous moment. You let it happen and you feel it take you down two more degrees of relaxation. Three, going deeper and deeper into a meditative state. Two, you just doubled your relaxation again and you are enjoying the tingly feelings and sensations of being in this altered state of mind. One, you have just entered the meditative state necessary to experience the spiritual realm. Now to demonstrate that you can open your eyes if you like and still remain in a meditative state, but very alert to your surroundings and you are able to function normally, after I count to three, open your eyes. And when I count to three again, you can close your eyes and feel the tingly sensation of relaxation increase ten times more than you were just feeling. One, two, three. Open your eyes. Feel alert, safe, and secure. One, two, three. Now, if you choose, you can slowly close your eyes and feel that deep, deep, familiar sense of a meditative trance as we now begin our prayer process. So before you have entered this meditative state, you have chosen a name of a person that you formerly disliked, blamed or resented. But you now have discovered that these improper defense mechanisms do not work effectively and often cause you more harm than good. 
With your mature adult and intelligent mind of the present, connect with a loving, caring, supremely intelligent, higher spiritual power. You are now ready to correct this subconscious defective defense mechanism with prayer while you are in this meditative state. So with this person's name in mind, ask your loving, intelligent, spiritual power for thoughts, emotions, and behavior pertaining to interaction between you and this person in the past, present, or future to be healthy, moral, kind, and helpful. To ask for yourself and for this other person. We also want to ask our higher spiritual power that you are both protected from resentment, anger, argument, and retaliation, and that you both genuinely feel forgiveness, mercy, a kindly view, and empathy for one another. And then, lastly, ask your higher spiritual power that this person that you formerly had uneasy feelings and thoughts about, now be able to have the desire to seek their own spiritual and moral awakening and elevated consciousness, just as you would have it for yourself. So now allow me to make one further suggestion. Whenever you desire to go into this meditative state of mind, you can do so easily and effortlessly without ever losing concentration on whatever activity you are doing. In one part of your mind, you are alert and focused and respond effectively and efficiently in whatever activity you are currently performing. But with another part of your mind, just by looking at your four knuckles on either hand, you will enter this alert state where you can instantly reprogram your subconscious mind to replace ineffective and undesirable emotions and thoughts and replace them with healthy and sane thinking and feelings. With prayer, knowing that you will be receiving additional help and power from a loving and intelligent supernatural spiritual source. The process can take a nanosecond because in the spiritual realm, the concept of time is insignificant. Now, as I count from one to five, start with experiencing your thumb with the number one, going to the index finger for the number two, and continue sequentially to the little finger for the number five, and joyfully return to your normal waking state, feeling better than before you started this process. One, coming back from your meditative state, say to yourself, every day in every way, I am getting more spiritually and morally awake. Two, feeling happy, joyous and free, more than you could have ever imagined. Keep coming back to your normal waking state of mind and body. Three, Returning back to normal, you know that this meditative process was successful and has greatly enhanced your mental, emotional, and physiological systems into a remarkable and superior state of health and well-being. Four, as you focus on your ring finger, you know that you can at any time in your normal waking state focus on your individual five fingers and immediately recall these suggestions to feel happy, joyous, and free, and always in control of your thinking, emotions, behavior. Five. Now, focusing on the little finger, bring your conscious... and subconscious mind to a higher and more elevated state than you ever experienced previously. Having a wonderful and beautiful smile upon your face, this joy transposes to every atom, molecule, cell, system, thought, emotion, belief that places you 
in the physical realm of the present. Open your eyes and you are fully awake. Now, just so no one is still in a trance state, say to yourself or out loud, I am awake and I am in control. So this process that you have just experienced will need to be repeated to clean up the many bits of dirt that accumulated in your mind. And once you have completed that, you will still need to repeat the process for routine spiritual and moral maintenance. We will now move on to doing this list making process for our silly little fears. Having fear is a natural instinct designed to keep you alive and well. But as with resentments and moral inventory, conducting a fear inventory will help you discover which fears serve you well and which ones might need to be discarded or renovated. So now we make another list. There may be a psychological barrier somewhere that tries to prevent you from going any further. But with all the success you have experienced, put that resistance to the side and just make the list. It may start out slow with the feeling of being stupid or foolish, but you will obtain a very significant revelation about your current relationship with fear if you just continue on. Start with I am afraid of and put down every foolish thing that comes to your mind. This is for your own viewing and no one else needs to see what you put down. Stop the presentation until this part is completed. Okay, back again. I once completed some exercises in a workbook for Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. The sequence of the theme of each question was altered, so it would be difficult to manipulate my answers so that I could get favorable results. So since no one was looking, I just answered the questions honestly as I could at the time. One of the questions was something like, what do you want the most? In which I replied, I wish everyone would leave me alone. Later in the exercise, one of the questions was, what are you afraid of? And I wrote, I am afraid of being alone. When I was made aware of the contradiction of my response, I came to realize that perhaps many other contradictory activities going on in my psyche might need to be looked at and then appropriately corrected. This fear list can work the same way. We are afraid we will get something and we are afraid that we won't get it. Some of what we put down on paper is absolutely ridiculous and funny. But they are not funny when they are hidden in the recesses of our mind and motivate insane, contradictory, and self-defeating behavior. So now make another list using your present mature, intelligent, and adult mind, making the necessary correction as to what you would prefer to feel in various life situations. Some fear is healthy and needs no correction. So in the inventory process, determine which fears need correction and which ones work just fine. Stop the slideshow and complete the exercise. Now you know the drill. Whenever you become aware that you are upset or motivated by unhealthy fear, halt, tap, look at your four knuckles, and ask your higher spiritual power to remove the negative and replace it with the positive. Practice, practice, practice. And the longer that you try it, the better you will get. Now I saved the real big bogeyman for last because no one wants to look at this bugaboo. We would much rather hide in dark closet in fear than take a look under the bed to see that there's nothing there. Believe me, from my personal experience, that this is really a false fear. And to just ask for the courage and do it, and then just do it, is the best route you can take. 
Most of us have hidden some shame, guilt, and remorse about our sexuality, and we keep it locked tight and away from anyone's prying eyes. The resistance is so strong that you will have no idea where to begin, or you may be locked into such denial that you might admit, like many men I've heard bravely tell in 12-step programs in front of other men, yeah, I had a brief affair once, but it was a long time ago. And they are very willing to go to the grave with the rest of the information. Or the reverse may happen as well, where their sexual exploits become bragging rights and their badge of courage when they are away from the wife. It is unfair of me to address women on this subject because most of my sexual activities had, with the opposite sex were unhealthy relationships with emotionally disturbed people. We would be drawn together because of our sexual appetites and needs, but the personal relationship between two people was a disaster because usually one or both lacked any development in morals or spirituality. And then there is a whole bunch of sexual activity and fantasy that just took place in my secret little mind, which is most difficult to correct or do anything about, lest someone else might find out. The bravado of having to present my masculinity to the world prohibited me from ever seeking professional help in this area or to ever express these issues that by no real fault of our own often develop early in our life. By doing these stepwise procedures all over again, but just for the sexual inventory and amends, we'll open the doors of hell and let you out if you so desire. But we don't really want to rehash all that old stuff and open the wound all over again. So we let it fester until it becomes cancerous. And these psychological sores hidden away in our psyche can show up as personality and physiological defects in our lives years later, unbeknownst to us, their real cause. Again, this written work is for your eyes only. In order to work with a spiritual moral sponsor or mentor, you never need to go into detail of any sexual, criminal, deviant behavior. The specifics should be left out because no one is at the spiritual state where they can love you unconditionally and not judge you. You should never put that burden upon another human being, whether friend, spouse, or preacher. Once we are finished with our spiritual and moral recovery procedure, we can discuss in a general way the nature of these issues with our sponsor or sponsee but we must hold the responsibility for how much detailed material we wish to discuss. And if it gets out and works against us, then part of that was our fault and our decision-making of how much to trust someone else. If you are presently in the middle of something that is causing you a great deal of stress, or you have been carrying something from the past that haunts your every step in the present, then ask your higher power for the courage and resolve to seek professional help. But again, don't put all your eggs in one basket. From past experience, I have met and trusted some psychology professionals that were very poor quality and were only in the career field for the prestige and the money. They didn't have much of a spiritual, let alone moral background. So they really had nothing to give except what they were taught in the academic institutions. And often behind the scenes, their own life was just as messed up as yours. Take the bull by the horns and just make a time sheet with periods of your life, zero to five years, five to 10 years, and so on, up to the present. Put names or descriptions if you no longer know the name involved with your sexual development as a child. Then put in your sentence of what happened and another of how you responded and another of how now at this age, how the whole thing should have gone down as if you were helping a child to see the more mature and healthier way to deal with sexual exposure and development. Go into meditation and prayer and arrive at sanity and peace with each account. Repeat as needed. When you finish fear, remorse, guilt, and shame will have departed. After you do all that you can with the help and direction of your higher spiritual power, Talk about it intelligently and carefully to another trusted person. Don't do it the other way around. You don't want to accept 
accentuate the negative and eliminate the positive. This is your house cleaning and you have to clean out the garbage in your mind in order to have to live happily. By learning and practicing these 12 step moral and spiritual recovery procedures in all your affairs, in all our affairs, we learn how to satisfactorily cope with problems that before we never had sufficient tools to prevent their turning our happiness upside down. We learn to deal with and avoid festering mental attitudes of anger, resentments, and self-pity. We clean our minds of guilt, shame, and remorse. We now have the correct tools and the help of an efficacious and triumphant higher spiritual power to level out our emotions, thinking, and behavior so that we can sanely manage our role in society without fear. We cast off the burdens of the past and the anxieties of the future to live spiritually and morally awake in the present. So this is the next exercise, once you've finished that, and they're long tasks. But once you've got an idea of what you're doing, make up your own steps. From what you've learned from doing the previous exercises, create your own stepwise outline and instructions of the things and sequences necessary for you to take you out of a negative emotional problem and back into peace. Then practice, observe, document your findings and revise your outline of the method so that it works effectively and you can do it in short order. Carry a copy of your outline and instructions on your person at all times. And if or when you become emotionally upset, take out your outline and read it. When you calm down, try to carry out the procedure. Repeat this procedure until it becomes a natural process. Okay, I forgot to tell you to stop the slideshow so that you have time to finish that last exercise. And then when you're finished, come back and I'll pick up again. Now, unfortunately, there are many people, such as myself, that when they're introduced to this moral and spiritual recovery sequence, have way too much pride, independence, and many emotional disorders so severe that they can't or won't follow these steps. I can only speak for myself, but I was happy not to ever drink alcohol or smoke cigarettes ever again. I was content to just go to 12-step meetings every day for the rest of my life. I didn't do the steps, but I listened to and hung out with others who probably never did the steps either. There was enough talk about the steps in meetings, and I read some of the literature that in about six years of soaking in the information, I moved to a new location and began preaching the steps to others. I hadn't changed much. I really knew very little about the value of morals, although I thought I was very honest. I had no problem preaching the steps for another 25 years in order that I may never drink again. And that was it, except for many, many disasters, turmoil, depression, and outright insane fits that I tried to hide under the rug until the rug looked like Mount Everest. Life gives us time. Looks like I'm still preaching the steps, but now I have some relative sanity and often experience the happy, joyous, free state of mind known as being spiritually and morally awake. I do go back to sleep sometimes, but I no longer have the tolerance for the high levels of pain and misery I used to put myself through. I am very happy for my moral and spiritual progress, but you may not want to walk in my shoes. That is why it is important for me to remain anonymous in spirit, as spirit is anonymous with us. In the live presentation, many of you know my name and others know my walk better than I know myself. I am always complimented by the high caliber of people that I get to associate with now. Many of you have had sound moral and spiritual practices all your life and attend these activities to satisfy your continual and burning desire to learn more. My theory is that learning and doing this spiritual moral advancement process will benefit you who can and do follow directions well, more than those who struggle with just haphazard and piecemeal progress. I believe 
if we are eternal, that we get many lifetimes to get get this right. And in this lifetime, I probably advanced more morally and spiritually than I did for a thousand lifetimes before. So we've gone through some exercises to begin to learn this process, and much, much more is required to get any good at it. It is obvious to most of you that one time, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, will not achieve any lasting results. There are two ways of doing the steps, and both are necessary to continue to progress morally and spiritually without stagnation or regression. One way to learn, do, and practice this is in your home, slowly but meticulously forward to get the basics and clean out all the accumulated dirt that built up over your lifetime. That may take quite a while, but once you get most of it out, you do not want to stop your routine because maintenance of your moral and spiritual condition is just as important as acquiring it. Our ego is cunning, baffling, and a treacherous foe and is waiting for the spiritual you to become weak and slip up in order to take you back down to the state of solitary, incomprehensible demoralization once again. Many who are in the ecstatic state of mind have said, it won't happen to me and here's how. But I have seen many fall, fail along the way and incomprehensible is just that. They don't know what happened. They used to understand how this worked, but they just can't seem to get it again. Don't be fooled by my rhetoric. Your higher spiritual power will always take you back. And now you know there are steps to take you back. The other way to do the step process is in a moment's notice. How did that little kid learn how to stop a line drive, turn a double play, and then hit a triple when he got up to bat? He did it by learning, practice, and ability. And in that sequence. So from what you've learned today, make your emergency plan. Write down a sequence of these exercises and discoveries so that you can first change the direction of the speeding car you are in and pull it over safely, just like you did in driver's ed years ago. Then pull out your emergency plan from your purse or wallet and read the instructions of what you must do sequentially. Try not to draw too much attention to yourself. Follow the sequence, look at your four knuckles, and accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. Then give thanks for saving you from another close call. This is the other way to work the 12 steps, by practicing it. You may become a major leaguer in time. So stop and complete this exercise. Make your list that works for you and then continue on. Remember the 12 step slogan is spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection and not spiritual stagnation or spiritual regression either. The farmer focuses on a distant goal to plow in a straight line. Keep your eye on the goal as well. Get another human being who is into this spiritual stuff to remind you to practice, to help you measure your progress, to hand you the lifeline when you are sinking, and to listen to you and wisely provide you tender feedback. Develop new habits to routinely inventory and amend your morals through meditation and prayer. Continue to grow morally and spiritually. Read, study, take classes, go to lectures on these subjects, and then take the material home to practice. Meditate alone or in groups frequently to commune with your higher spiritual power, who will never let you down. See to it that your own mind is order, and then help those who are put in your path and ask for your assistance. I have other slideshow presentations on how to start discussion meetings and business meetings in order to form your own support group. The material is too in-depth to cover satisfactorily in this slideshow. I also have more in-depth slideshow presentations about teaching and mentoring this 12-step information to someone who has asked you to help them specifically with this method of moral and spiritual recovery. 
but I will discuss a few important basics to prevent you from making some common mistakes. When you first start to feel these ecstatic sensations created from our first experience with actual spiritual and moral awakening, we want to rush out and save the world. Many want to become counselors or at least help their family and friends. Unfortunately, with this attitude and little instruction or skills in teaching or mentoring, you are likely to make some serious mistakes and could very well ruin some relationships for a lifetime. To talk these spiritual and moral matters with those who know you and even those who don't know you is like going into the boxing ring and leading with your chin. You will be knocked down in short order. So carrying the message, teaching others, and my favorite, preaching, are the last step of this process. You have to know the subject well and can routinely reproduce satisfactory results before you can teach it to someone else. Teaching is not by a seat of the pants operation. There are many separate skills that need to be learned in order to teach someone this subject and install enthusiasm and a desire to follow this course. Presentation skills, listening skills, meditation and prayer skills, staying connected with the higher spiritual power skills are all part of effectively carrying this message to someone who asks you for your direction and assistance. As a teacher, the greatest skill would be to make yourself less, not greater than the student. The master washed the feet of the disciples. As the mentor, we are humble servant and not the master. How is such a thing done? Well, with our de well-developed connection with a higher spiritual power, it is the power and the intelligence and the knowledge flowing through us that accomplishes the success. It has nothing to do with this meat suit that we're wearing. If we know nothing of ego deflation, then we know nothing of how to teach someone spiritual and moral advancement techniques. Again, as with learning how to awaken spiritually and morally, a stepwise checklist should be developed and followed to teach you how to teach. Teaching is advanced learning. To teach, you will do more than the student, not less. You will have to demonstrate patience and tolerance at a level beyond your present understanding. Here are some steps to teaching. One, meditate and pray for help and guidance from your higher spiritual power in each and every activity with the new person. Two, do not be shy about discussing prayer, meditation, or your concept of a higher spiritual power. Three, discuss confidentiality and then tell them your story. A, what it was like when you tried to manage your life by your self-sufficiency. B, what happened, and C, what it is like now to be spiritually awake. And then four, set up a schedule and appointments to carry out the training, instruction, and review process necessary to achieve a spiritual awakening. Naturally, no one follows this advice because each of us know what we are doing and we are different than the rest of those bozos. So here's a quick checklist just in case you get stuck with a flat tire out there in the wilderness and need a way out. If you're going to head out into the wilderness of teaching others spiritual and moral principles, you might want to make a copy of this slide to use as a map as you go out into the unexplored territory. When you come back, tell us how it worked for you. And after your wounds heal, go out and give it a few more tries. That's how I did it. I didn't need no stinking classes or mentoring. I was my own self-made man. The stick or the carrot? Some of us prefer the stick because we never tasted the carrot. There are specific skills for just listening. Here are a few on this slide. One, you look at their mouth and concentrate on your two ears and two eyes. Two, you do not interrupt, give advice, share similar experience, or pontificate. Three, when they stop talking, be able to repeat the last sentence. And four, if you speak, listen for feedback so that you know they understood what you said. To this day, I would not give myself a high score on my listening skills. I like to hear myself talk and hear how smart I am. 
And when I can't do that, I like to read how smart I am. The listening skills I put on the slide apply to me. I have to remember this technique and ask my higher spiritual power for help in listening to others before I even meet them. Otherwise, I go into a default mode and compete for my turn, wanting to embellish my experience and tell you what I'm, what you must do. You might have noticed that in this presentation. It is a very difficult task to listen. It is even more difficult to obey. Without the help of my higher spiritual power, without the discipline to contact my higher spiritual power frequently and preferably before the endeavor, well then unfortunately I am on my own and often going back down the road to many bad habits. The information presented on this slide is sage direction. In order not to daydream and fantasize while someone else is speaking, I had to learn how to literally look at their mouth and tell myself continually I had two eyes to see and two ears to listen. I had to learn how to be able to repeat their last sentence when they stopped talking. I had to stop competing for my turn so that I could tell them all about my similar experiences or give them advice. And if I did speak at all, I had to listen for feedback to see if they understood what I said. What an order. I can't do this. And actually, I can't. But learning how to meditate and pray more frequently, I can contact higher spiritual power who will gladly assist me in practicing these skills so that I can improve some and continue to progress spiritually. Final exam. Bet you didn't think there would be a test. Not to worry. This exam is supposed to be fun and lighthearted. I hope it turns out that way. Rather than a test, an exam can be used as a learning tool to provide students the answers they need to take away from the course. As a learning tool, making all the possible wrong assumptions to be completely ridiculous provides the student information as well. So in the following multiple choice exam questions, there is always one obviously correct answer and three ridiculously wrong answers. Let's do about 10 questions so you can see how this technique works. And perhaps sometimes, sometime in your life, you can pull this out of your bag of tricks and help someone enjoy learning. Are you ready? Question one. We learn and do this moral and spiritual awakening method to A. Make tons of money. B. Become famous. C. To restore our mind to healthy emotions and thoughts and to solve any problems effectively. And D, to get to heaven first and have one of the best jobs and dwellings and to know the really cool people there. Now you may not believe how social groups can become so disoriented and misconstrue or completely turn upside down the spiritual and moral principles you're supposed to be learning, but it happens all the time, on the job, in the family, and even in your church or spiritual center. How quickly we conform to majority rules rather than listen to the minority who may be more right on the right path than the rest of us. So in an unexpected way, this type of exam points out the correct answer, but also points out the ridiculous hidden agendas our egos hang on to looking for someone else to validate our such nonsense and divert us off our spiritual and moral path. Question two. We teach this moral and spiritual method to A, make tons of money, B, to become famous, C, both A and B, and D, to better learn the method ourselves. Well, I think many of us still deep down inside would like answer C to be the correct one, but the correct answer is D. Three. Spiritual progress is about A, morality. B. Higher education and intellect. C. Geometry, physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, and astronomy. D. Going naked, begging for food, and living in a cave. D sounds pretty cool, but the correct answer is... A. Yay! Yay! 
four, the number of steps in a moral and spiritual awakening procedure, A, must represent a number from ancient scripture. B, must be less than the square root of pi times seven. C, have a lot to do with the laws of astrology, which are too complicated to put in this answer. And D, are insignificant. I really don't know what the square root of pi times seven comes out to be, but the correct answer is greater than the square root of pi. No, I'm kidding. There are no trick questions on this exam. The correct answer is D, but I'm really stepping on a lot of toes in our Judeo-Christian world by stepping away from supernatural number 12. And my skepticism on how a planet in retrograde, which is only a change in appearance because the planet is still traveling at the same speed on the same course, or there's nothing different from a full moon and no moon. The moon still goes around the Earth at the same volume. There's very little difference even in the gravitational pull because the tides are a very insignificant change. But I can't see how those astronomical events have anything but a placebo effect upon people. But then again, there are many advanced Buddhist monks and probably many other advanced beings who know a lot more than my skeptical little mind. I once heard a numerologist from Singapore who baffled whatever I presently thought I knew. So actually, depending on your point of reference, the answer I want you to choose may not be as correct as I think. But hopefully you get the point I'm trying to make. Whether it is three steps or 25 the end result is the important issue and not the number of steps it takes to present the information to someone. Five, self-sufficiency. A is the most important character trait you can have because you don't need anyone else in this world, or at least you can't really trust anyone. And if you want something done, you have to do it yourself. B is what it takes to win the Super Bowl. C may not be the almighty character trait needed to find happiness in your life. And D, will acquire tons of money and make you famous. I just wanted you to be exposed to the idea that some believe that self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-centeredness, and just plain old selfishness are the root of many of our problems. But when I first did a moral inventory, I thought that I would come up with some pretty bad stuff. But the one that led the list was selfishness. And I felt relieved because at that time, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that. My number two offender was lust. And I didn't think there was anything wrong with that either. It took me many years of hard knocks to change my opinion. But then again, there's always making tons of money and becoming famous. Everyone still seems to believe that it'll work if you do it from the correct angle. Six, using a higher spiritual power in your life to achieve success, A, is for sniveling weaklings who don't value self-sufficiency as the only tool anyone ever needs. B, is absolutely ridiculous idea because everyone knows that we humans are the smartest beings in the universe and we created everything important like the cell phone, math, and the Hubble telescope. C, is absolutely absurd because scientists who are the smartest people in the whole universe have proven beyond a doubt with their billion dollar electron colliders and space telescopes that only this physical realm can exist and there is nothing else. Or D, might help. Using a higher spiritual power in your life to achieve success might help. You might wanna give it a try sometime. A higher spiritual power, A, should be something satisfying, helpful, and of your own understanding. B, is a name that should never be mentioned because it is so great and superior to us peons that we could be sent directly to a burning inferno if we ever talked about it. C, should be determined by people who are much smarter than us and who know about these things much better than we could do with our own limited understanding. Or D, is singular, but can be threefold, 
and often has many angels and saints and avatars to assist, if you are good. But if you're bad, it also has some other assistance for those issues as well. Well, I might be stepping on the toes of some of you, but <clears throat> we have a saying in 12-step uh, recovery, we step on the toes of others, and they retaliate seemingly without provocation. But didn't we, in fact, set the ball in motion? Eight, the purpose of meditation in this presented moral and spiritual awakening process is to a transform into a nonlinear reality and be given all the secrets of the universe so that when you come back to this reality, you will know more than everyone else. B is to get to know and hang out with the really cool people. C is to calm down your egoic race mind so that you can pray correctly for moral and spiritual improvements in your present worldly life. D is a curriculum requirement of your spiritual training and will get you promoted to the next spiritual rank in your spiritual organization. Oops, I stepped on some more toes. Nine, prayer. A, should be performed in front of others so they can see how pious and spiritual you really are. B, should be performed in groups with many of your similar thinking spiritual friends so they can see how pious and spiritual you really are. C, should be, be performed away and, and secluded from others and your similar thinking spiritual friends so they can see how pious and spiritual you really are. D is not a performance for others and your similar thinking spiritual friends so they can see how pious and spiritual you really are. I think this one comes right out of the gospel. Question 10, amends. A, are Herculean tasks to be performed in front of others and your similar thinking spiritual friends so they can see how pious and spiritual you really are. B, if conducted correctly, will provide you a badge of courage and bragging rights for the rest of your life. C, if conducted correctly and with the help of your higher spiritual power, will restore your thinking, emotions, and behavior to sanity and keep you spiritually and morally awake. Or D, if done correctly, will keep you in everlasting misery and incomprehensible solitary demoralization. And this one comes directly from most 12-step meetings, but only in those meetings A, B, and D are the correct answer, and C is considered totally absurd. Again, just kidding, but to anyone in the audience or at home, who did not appreciate or was offended by this slideshow, slideshow exam, I offer my sincere apologies. After such deep and sincere subject matter, I thought that it might be a good idea to lighten up the audience a bit. And that goes as well with any of your attempts to perform some of these exercises and procedures. Do not end up at a point where you feel depressed, ashamed, angry, or so forth. End your so session with meditation, coming out feeling renewed, confident, and whole. These procedures are designed to make you happy, joyous, and free. And if you're not getting that experience, then you may be doing it wrong. So this is my first of several audio slideshows I wish to create. Bill Wilson spent his sober life creating an altruistic organization and a spiritual democratic corporation to make sure things would run smoothly after his death. He succeeded thus far since his passing in 1971. The organization system that he created to go along with the spiritual and moral awakening procedures is quite remarkable and has many intricacies that I believe could be useful and carried on to many other social or even government or corporate activities to create a higher level of enthusiasm and esteem for the personnel participating in service and support activities for the greater good. 
I've tried to cover most of this material in several of my books, which are available on Amazon. The Bill Wilson Paradigm, a blueprint for the next generation, I believe to be the most generic, aimed at providing this information about starting and organizing a system of support groups to learn and practice these spiritual awakening principles and procedures without any other particular motive than that. These are my current books about 12-step recovery and organizational principles and are available on Amazon and CreateSpace. I am hoping to make tons of money and become famous. And these books are addressed to a very specific audience with very specific problems, all of which I have experienced in my life and used many 12-step recovery programs in order to live a normal life. Hopefully they may be of help to form other confidential support groups to help one another recover from these seemingly hopeless maladies. My writing and editing skills have improved somewhat over time, but I can only afford to self-publish with the very economic convenient service that CreateSpace provides. So in reading my material, you will run into misspellings, typos, and incomplete sentences. Also the material has been altered to suit my biases. Hopefully the reader can see through my opinionated personality and derive a purer message than what I am able to create. Please forgive my rants and raves, another dangerous defect of my character that I unfortunately still derive some sort of pleasure from no matter how many hardships such an attitude has presented in my life. Some of the material is highly complex and my limited writing skills could not reduce the information to a common language and simple understanding. The 12 step slogan that might be useful in reading some of this material is, take what you need and leave the rest. You will know where to find it if you need the information later on. The thicker books contain much of the information on the spiritual democratic participation and the spiritual corporate administration. And the subsequent traditions and standards applied to those. You can get very bogged down in the middle or even the beginning of some of these chapters. My suggestion is to get out of the bog and go on to something more understandable and enlightening. So my slideshow, presentation, and workshop come to an end. I would like to rephrase something taken from 12-step literature for final commentary. Still, you may say that you will not have the contact with 12-step support groups that pertain to your particular needs. Of that, we cannot be sure. Your personal activities and your higher spiritual power will determine that. So remember to keep your reliance upon these methods and your higher spiritual power, and you will learn how to create the fellowship you crave. These slideshows and the books are meant to be suggestive only. I know only a little, and there are many of you who are far superior to my education and knowledge. Through meditation, your higher spiritual power will reveal more to you as needed. Trust your higher spiritual power, clean house, and help others when they ask. See to it that your moral and spiritual progress is truthful and ongoing. Great events will come to pass if you abandon yourself to the direction of your higher spiritual power and these newly found moral and spiritual principles. Admit your faults and successes freely in order to help the next person. These are your qualifications. Clear away the wreckage of the past, the fear of the future, and live morally and spiritually in the present. Give freely of what you have found and join in with others to raise the level of your consciousness in this physical world. Your heavenly higher spiritual power should never let you down. So I'd like to thank you for listening and putting up with my limited narrative skills. Um, I'm going to finish at this point. I think you can get some information out of this. I apologize at the quality. Uh, again, I'm not a professional narrator, and I put this together. Hopefully, it will help someone. And thanks for your time and your patience.